Welcome, I'm your host, Malcolm Gallagher. From our BizVision studios in the UK, you're watching the BVTV network. Now, later this year, 2021, the 75th anniversary of the premiering of that fabulous film, It's a Wonderful Life, starring James Stewart and Donna Reed. I wasn't there for the the premiere, by the way, but I've watched it, you know. I say that as passing because the wonderful light to many is the dream of finding the love of your life, getting married, buying a house and starting a family. And the house is so often the focal point of that wonderful life. Now, sadly, it seems to me that for many, their wonderful life dreams may be on hold as globally we meet the COVID challenge, redundancy is happening, money's draining away, and perhaps credit ratings are being damaged. So how can that home dream be realistically achieved? What is it that we all need to know about the mysteries of real estate to help us no matter our age or our situation in life that we're in? My guest today is an expert in all things real estate, as well as being an experienced entrepreneur. So let's go meet the CEO of EME Companies, Eric Engerbretson. Welcome, Eric. Hey, Malcolm. Thanks for having me on. Hey, it's, it's brilliant. And you are in one of the most exciting uh, areas that, uh, that I've ever visited in, in the USA, and that's Atlanta, isn't it? Near close to Atlanta, are you? Yes. Yeah. Just north of Atlanta. Um, so the North Metro. So the city of Atlanta, the Southeast. Yep. Yeah. I think I just think George is very, very exciting. And it's so accessible to to many places, you know, east to Carolina yep. and so on, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. It's it, Atlanta over the past, I would say, decade has really benefited from you know, our weather in a lot of ways, we have, yeah. we have very temperate winters, um, hot summers, but so a lot of people from New York City, California, even have really been relocating to Atlanta, a lot of the big tech companies have been relocating, which has really benefited our real estate in, uh, in some pretty dramatic ways. Yes, yeah. I, I've interviewed quite a few different companies from uh, Atlanta just recently, and, and it's very exciting. And it just reminds me, though, before I move on to our questions, I have to make a little note, Eric. I, I just smashed the glass recently on that still that I've got I've gone with the wind, and I haven't mentioned it. So I'd better get that done on my to-do list for this weekend. <laughs> yes, I? yeah. yeah uh, Eric, I'm delighted uh, that you kindly agreed to guest on our BBTV network, which is on our enterprising BizWise channel. And in this BBTV show, viewers and listeners, I'll be talking to Eric in my usual three parts. First, I'll ask him to talk about the world of real estate as he sees it. It's an emotional yeah. purchase, and perhaps sometimes buyers let their emotions rule their head. What's his best tips? For a buyer looking at a property, what insider questions should they be asking? Part two, we'll move to talking about his philosophy on real estate. Where do you see, see his purpose uh, going, and especially over the next few years? In part three, I'm introducing him to our mythical company called James and Zoe. They're in love, but COVID has prevented them from getting married. How are they ever going to get that dream home? So I'm setting Eric a challenge. Eric, let's start our talk in part one. I'm asking you to possibly give away some trade secrets, but, you know, sure. just between you and me, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the world. And the world. Uh, house buying is an emotional purchase, and, and perhaps yeah. sometimes buyers let their emotions rule their head. And I'm guessing real estate sellers know that. So what's your best tips for a buyer looking at a property? What insider questions should they be asking? Yeah, I mean, I think when it comes to that side, you're exactly right. Um, especially if you are a younger couple or a first-time home buyer, um, or even a uh, an older couple that's maybe downsizing. Downsizing, it's very easy to get emotional when you see a house and it's like you could envision yourself living there or furnishing that living room or whatever. I think the biggest number one thing you can do is first off, work with professionals. So work with professional real estate agents, professional loan officers who can help guide you and answer questions that you may have. But the second most important thing you can do personally is set your boundaries from day one. Before you go look at a house, set your boundaries. My max that I'm willing to spend is $500,000. I'm not going to spend more than that, period, full stop. Doesn't matter what the house is. Um, and it's kind of like setting boundaries. Like I hate to make this analogy, but almost like in gambling, like when you go into a casino, 
you should have an idea of how much money you're willing to lose. And if you, if you earn a certain amount of money or win, you should be willing to walk and you should have those boundaries before you walk in. It's the same thing with a house. If you walk into a house that's listed at 450 and your agent tells you that there's going to be multiple offers, you need to know what your ceiling is. Cause if you don't, then you allow yourself to get emotional and play into the seller side. Obviously the sellers want you to be emotional yeah. and hopefully <laughs> overpay and, and get into these, that type of situation. But I think work with professionals, number one, and then know your boundaries before you even set foot in a single house are probably the two biggest things you can do for yourself. Yeah. Uh, so how does that seller try to get you to up the spend? Is it by fear? You know, there's lots of other people around or? Uh... Yes. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, you're exactly right. Fear is probably, or yeah, I mean, that fear of missing out, right? I mean, yeah, I think that's yeah. FOMO, common, FOMO, common, yeah, yeah. The FOMO. Yeah. I mean, I think that's very real, um, yeah, especially in the market that we're in now with inventory levels, especially in the Southeast of the United States, really across the United States altogether, we're seeing very low inventory and the millennial generation is now buying houses and they are out and they are, they are, um, they want to move to the house with the fence and have room for their dogs, so on and so forth. Yeah. And so what the sellers do is they create small windows. They say, well, the house is open from 12 to four and that's the only time you can see it. So then you get cars lined up, you get people going through the houses that's created some COVID, you know, intricacies yeah. as well. But, but that creates that excitement, almost like an auction, right? It's, when you're there with five other people seeing the house, that creates your sense of urgency and maybe helps push those boundaries out from the seller point of view. Mm. Sneaky. Well, sneaky, sneaky but it's, yeah. It's, yeah, yeah it's, it's, everyone plays the game. We all play the same game, right? You just got to know what game you're playing. Yeah. Uh, how do you know, though, when you might be um, lie, being lied to? You know, uh, uh, you know, until the until the survey is done, you there's lots of things you don't discover, isn't there? What 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 yeah. do you go and look for? You know, I think some of the basic things that again, back to that working with a professional that a lot of agents are gonna look for is just basic maintenance, right? If you everybody's gone through a house, everybody's had that friend that just does not take care of their their place, right? Yeah. And when you go through that house, if you see deferred maintenance kind of, you know, chip paint or um, you know, the, the railing on the deck is wobbly or whatever, just stuff that's clearly being overlooked. I think that can be an indication that maybe they're overlooking other things as well. So working with those professionals and, and also having an eye for it yourself, if the house is really tidy and clean and, and most houses, if they're working with a good listing agent will be, but those are just some things that can kind of give you an indication that maybe there's something underneath the curtains that once we go on a contract and we do an inspection or a survey, we're going to find out some things that maybe we don't like. Yeah, yeah. I I um, did a lot of work with a, a guy sadly dead now, died now, who built himself up from being a joiner who couldn't write to being a multimillionaire selling houses. You know, yeah. and he just had so many wonderful tricks. Now you know, make certain that the coffee's on as when people yeah. could come around to smell the, the house, and then he would do a uh, little home. Uh, parties and everything. So uh, eventually what people were doing was selling his houses. He didn't have to do any advertising. Yeah, they did it for him. I have a good friend of mine who always says in the winter, you want the heat up so that when they walk in, it's nice and warm. In the summer, you want the AC burning cold so that yeah. when they walk in, they 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 get that chill. Um, it just kind of makes them feel like, oh, this house operates really well. Yeah, yeah, yeah uh, that's uh, excellent. Thanks for some great advice there. Uh, before yeah. we move to part two, Eric, I'd just like to remind viewers and listeners of your URL for your website. Um, obviously, viewers, you can see it on the screen behind me. But for listeners, let me just uh, read that out for you. It's all the W's as usual. E-M-E, E-M-E companies, and that's companies a-N-I-E-S, E-M-E companies.com. Eric, time for part two. You've okay. been an entrepreneur all your work in life and you've achieved success. And I guess that wonderful life. I've seen the pictures of you and the wife and the kids. Yes. Uh, brilliant. Really nice. Really nice. Yeah. I'm guessing that because of the nature of housing and construction, you'll have met a number of challenges along the way, perhaps even some that would also challenge your integrity. It's the nature of construction, I think, at times. Tell us how you managed to steer a clear and honest journey. 
What have you seen as your purpose, your guiding light as a businessman? Yeah, I mean, I think um, when I think about the integrity side of the business, I think real estate, as you mentioned, can sometimes get a stigma of, you know, hard selling or, you know, trying to take advantage of people. I think at the core, the most important thing, I had a mentor one time tell me that if you do the right thing by people, the money will come. You can't, yeah. you can't, the drive can't be the money. The drive needs to be the people that you serve, the people that you help and doing right by everybody. And if you do that, then the money will come, the success will come, you know, any sort of notoriety that you want will come. But it starts by doing right by every person you talk to, treat everybody the same, no matter what the situation is, and try to treat them like you would like to be treated. And I think that's, that's kind of something that I live by, regardless of the person that I talk to, we're going to have a very similar conversation as the next person. Um, and, you know, and, and just try to serve people because I think that those, those are the people that are going to refer you. Those are the people that are going to want to continue to do business with you and hopefully ultimately become, you know, your, your friends and colleagues. Yeah. Yeah. And, and of course they will recommend you as my builder client did, you know, because he, he spent a lot of money on snagging and anything like that. He'd sort them out very, very quickly. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, when we're talking there about integrity, you must have been challenged a few times. You know, people must have said, oh, we can make a quick book on this. We can do a flip on that and so on. You know, I know flipping is not a a bad thing, but sometimes it can be done naughtily, can't it? Yeah. I mean, I think when it comes to the the flipping side or or wholesaling, if you will, people that try to find people in precarious situations and and then try to sell that contract to somebody yeah. else and make you know the spread or whatever. What I my personal experience on that has been transparency is the key. If people are not being transparent, if they're not being upfront, you don't want to do business with them, no matter what the short term gain is. Because when when people try to keep people in the dark or they're like, oh well, let's show this settlement statement to the seller, but show this settlement statement to the buyer so that they don't know how much you know, where my, my nut came from that that's when you want to say, you know, okay, hold on, let's take a step back and ask more questions. I think questions are always your friend. Um, and transparency is the key. I think I attempt to be as transparent as possible with everybody that I encounter, whether it's in business or just on a personal level, I think transparent people are more interesting than, than than people that try to hide or game the system. Um, because everybody has their own little uniqueness and, uh, but transparency is the key. If people aren't being transparent, then that's when you want to take a step back and start asking questions and keep asking questions until you feel comfortable. Yes. Great, great answer there. But EME companies, your, your set of companies as, as very, I'm going to call them divisions. You tell me what they are, yeah. but you know, you, you explain to us what, um, how EME operates. Yeah, absolutely. So EME is a, a family business. It's a family holding business. So it's uh, myself, my sister, uh, Sarah Carzoli, and my, yeah. and my wife um, who operate the business. And so we, we operate um, an outreach business, which is like consulting for investors and uh, entrepreneurs. We operate a small rental portfolio that is, uh, has a mix within it of just traditional rental properties, as well as short-term vacation rentals and, and uh, short-term lease rentals. Um, and then my wife operates a business called Emmy Design where she makes, you know, like custom gifts and home, um, mostly home decor things. Um, and so that's kind of the mix of the business um, as it's set up. And, you know, again, very family focused. EME is actually the initials of my kids. Um, right. And so that's where the EME came from. It happens to be my initials as well. But, um, but yeah. That's that's what we do. I, I think that's great. I really like that. Yeah, using the initials. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, yeah. We we we've, we've we've done a similar thing uh, with our our children, but not the problem is our grandchildren keep growing. So I'm having to have a bigger yeah. <laughs> a bigger password. But the best the best part about that story, Malcolm, is when it came time to name my children, and maybe this will sound me make me sound a little narcissistic, but I told my wife, I said, you can pick the name but I would like them to have the EME initials. I'm not sure why I always had an affinity to that. So I, I gave the, the box and said EME and she got to pick the names. Uh, brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Eric. Now for part three. 
it's your advisory challenge. Eric's okay. advisory challenge. I'm going to introduce you to a, a mythical couple. They're called James okay. and Zoe. Um, All right. I, I say mythical so that any advice you give has no liability, obviously. They're in love, sure. but COVID has prevented them from getting married. They've been furloughed. So money is tight, but both are in credible professions. They want to get married, want to get on the property ladder, want to have children soon, want to live the dream. How should they plan to achieve all of this without putting themselves at a big financial risk as we all face uncertainty? How should they be convincing a mortgage company or even a landlord that they're a sound bet? How would you suggest they make that dream come true? Yeah, so we're going to get to the common thread here. So the first thing is get that team in place. Mm. Talk to a, a professional real estate agent and a professional loan officer. Um, you, that's step one, because then you can lay out the plan. And then the next thing you need to decide is what is our timeline? Okay, our current lease ends in 90 days, let's say. Their, their lease ends the end of June. So then that becomes your runway. So what do we need to do now between now and the end of June to accomplish whatever the goal is that you want to achieve? And, and in this case, it's, it's purchasing a home. You know, so then it's looking at, okay, you're currently furloughed. When do you come off furlough? When do you go back to work? Because that's important. A bank is not going to lend you money until you're back to work. So mm -hmm. that's kind of step one. So let's, for this um, example, let's say they start back to work May 1st. Yeah. So then you look at it and say, okay, they go back to work May 1st, so we can use their income, whatever that is. Um, and now do we have any savings? Do we need to save money? Do, is it possible to ask a parent to help them with a gift to, to put them in a house in a better position, put more money down to make the payment more affordable? Um, those are all the conversations that, that, would, be, that would be had with um, uh, Zoe and I can't remember her husband's There's a name. James, Sir James, James and Zoe. Yeah, James yeah, and Zoe. Yeah. Those are the conversations that we would be having with them um, to create that plan. Again, back to the transparency, back to you know knowing all the different facets. And then once we know, okay, income is back stable, your credit scores are acceptable because even though you had to go into furlough, you were able to continue to meet your obligations. And then we've been able to come up with uh, some sort of down payment. And then let's back into what's affordable for you, create that box, then you can go shop and make sure that you have your parameters in place so that you don't get over your skis and fall prey um, to you know, some of the, the yeah. disadvantages in the market. Yeah, I'm with you. Excellent advice. Excellent advice, Eric. The media love stories about repossessions, financial disasters, broken marriages, the stories can be both disheartening and dream-breaking, but that dream can become a reality if you approach it with awareness, knowledge, and planning, as Eric Engerbretson of AME has so expertly shown us today. Thanks, Eric, for a great interview. Thank you, Malcolm. I really appreciate you having me on.